Hi everyone, welcome back to AP Psychology with me, Miss Baines, your teacher, where you can take advantage of being able to pause and rewind me as I deliver you our latest content. So go ahead and grab those markers, get yourself a nice comfy face in which to work, and of course don't forget those important binder notes that go in lockstep order with the very last video of this unit called Unit 5, Video 11. <laughs> I'm running out of fingers here. Okay, so we're in our final set of notes for Unit 5. It's a pretty quick one, and we're going to be talking about the extremes of intelligence and influences on intelligence. Extremes of intelligence being either end of the normal curve, right? A valid intelligence test divides two groups of people into two extremes, meaning extreme scores. So either extremely high or extremely low. First up are the intellectually disabled. That would be people with an IQ of about 70 or below, okay? What we used to call mentally retarded, which by the way is a phrase we no longer use nor ever should use, is now known as an intellectual disability. It's defined as an IQ of 70 or lower. The individuals who score with a high intelligence would be someone with an IQ of 135 or higher. These are obviously very different extremes, right? Very different intelligences and very different people. So an intellectual disability is having significantly below average intellectual functioning and limitations in at least two areas of adaptive functioning. Adaptive meaning being able to adapt to or respond to and thrive in essentially in one's world. So adaptive functioning includes things like communication skills, self-care, so for example being able to shower and brush or comb your own hair, being able to brush your teeth, those kinds of things. The ability to live independently, meaning to leave home, right? Leave mom and dad and go live on one's own. Having social skills or being part of a community. Okay, kind of understanding the way people network and stuff and how to do all of that. Having a trait of self-direction, meaning that you're not needing to be redirected every single moment when you're learning something new. Having an awareness of health and safety, understanding certain academics and leisure, and being able to work. Okay, so again, it's below average intellectual functioning as well as limitations in at least two of those areas that I've just listed. Okay, so when it comes to intellectual disabilities, there are various genetic factors. For instance, people with Down syndrome is when somebody has conceived a baby with an extra chromosome. There's environmental factors, too, that could be intellectual disability, like fetal alcohol syndrome, which is when the mother consumed too much alcohol while she was pregnant. And that is environmental, right? Not genetic, just because the baby's inside the mother. It was caused while pregnant, but it was an outside poison that was allowed to hurt the living fetus who had already formed its own genetic makeup. Another is deprivation or neglect which is also an environmental one. Once a child is born and they're not stimulated, maybe, or they're malnourished, maybe not given the proper nutritious formula or breast milk or food during infancy. And so also there's, and there are no other apparent or unknown causes causing it. There is no cure for any of these, okay? So we almost say cure as if it's a disease, like we're going to have a vaccine for intellectual disability or something. I don't want you to go down that slippery slope of thinking that these people have a disease. But there is, in fact, no cure, okay? There's no fixing intellectual disabilities, even when it's something like the mother or the father does after the baby is born. Like, I don't know, smoking cigarettes, for example. However, there are some preventative measures for certain types of intellectual disabilities. There are tests that they can perform on newborns and fetuses to find out if there are hidden genetic disorders, like Down syndrome, as I said before, or another fairly common one called PKU. PKU is a person's inability to process protein. So if a child eats protein, as one does in a normal diet, they essentially become intellectually or physically disabled. So if we can detect it early, the intellectual disability associated with PKU can be prevented by not eating protein. 
Therefore, having a special diet and genetic counseling during pregnancy care and services and education offered to new parents is extremely important, okay? These are just some of the preventive strategy. Just taking a prenatal vitamin or even just going to all your prenatal care visits with the doctor, which are usually at about once a month for most of the pregnancy, but towards the end, every two weeks and then every week, well, that's a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of money if you don't have health care. So think of all the other blockades that can stop people from doing the right thing when they have to worry about working several jobs or they don't have health care or they're impoverished to even pay for the food that they should be eating when they're pregnant. And if they don't have health care to even go to their doctor, how are we going to blame them for a deficit of some sort when there's nothing they can do about it? There are different levels of intellectual disabilities. There's mild, moderate, severe, and profound. You need to know a little bit about each one of these. So mild intellectual disability is associated with an IQ of about 50 to 70. So 85% of those with intellectual disabilities are actually in the mild range. Okay, their academic abilities are approximately at the sixth grade level. They can learn to live on their own and even hold down a job. Then there is the moderate level, which is an IQ level of 35 to 49. The academic abilities here are at approximately around the second grade level. They can be trained in self-care and they can acquire some reading and writing skills, but they often need some supervision. And then there is severe which is an IQ of about 20 to 34, the mental capacity of approximately a five-year-old. So they can learn to talk in most cases and perform simple tasks, but they do need to be closely supervised. And then we have the profound. This is an IQ of below 20. The mental age is less than three years old, and there is a very limited communication ability, if any, and they require constant supervision. They also usually have numerous physical disabilities as well, so it kind of lends itself to the understanding that there's a lot going on here and a lot of severe difficulties. Let's talk about the other end now, intellectually gifted kids. Intellectually gifted children have an IQ score of about 130 to 135. That's on the other end of the spectrum. We went from intellectually disabled to the intellectually gifted having an IQ score of about 130 to 135 range. The most extensive research on giftedness done by a study resulting in the data of much of what we know about the subject today. So they studied over 1,500 students near the top of the IQ range all the way into adulthood and they found out that the gifted children excelled in school, had an overall health had good overall health and were generally happy. Newer research suggests that highly gifted children may be susceptible to certain physical or psychological disorders like depression. Most continued on a path of success though and led ordinary and undistinguished lives. And odd, right, that they didn't all turn out to be Steve Jobs of the world, making a gajillion dollars and, you know, inventing something really important, right? Most intellectually gifted people led relatively normal lives. So let's talk about the influences on intelligence and the genetic versus the environmental influence, right? There's no other topic in psychology that is so passionately followed as the one that asks us to question whether or not intelligence is due to genetics or environment, which says, is our intelligence something we're born with or is our intelligence something that are challenged with on the environmental? This is a widely debated, widely researched topic. So studies of twins, family members, and adopted children, the idea that there is a significant genetic contribution to intelligence. So in talking about genetic influence, so if we look at this graph here that I've got, identical twins, we are together, right? So identical twins who are raised together are very, very similar in their intelligence scores. Right? This makes sense. The measuring of the correlation. So the higher it is, the stronger the correlation is. Look how close it is to one, right? Holy moly. <laughs> then there's a lower correlation with identical twins that are reared together, showing some environmental effect. 
So identical twins reared apart this column over here. The difference between this level and the, that level is the fact that there is an absence here and the strength of the correlation indicates that it is how much is due to environmental factors. This much is due to genetics here and this much is due to environment. We can't discount how influential our genes are, but we also can't discount the fact that environmental definitely makes a difference. So the next column here are fraternal twins, meaning not DNA clones of one another like, like we have with the identical twins, right? These just happen to be two babies in the same womb at the same time that are raised by the same parents and are together, and they have a lower correlation than the identical twins. show. There is a genetic factor here still, okay, definitely a genetic factor, but the fraternal twins are lower than both groups of identical twin siblings that were reared together or raised apart, right? The unrelated individuals raised together, okay? Genetic influences are huge. Studies of twins have pointed towards genetic influences. We said this with the Minnesota Twin Project at the University of Minnesota with James Buchert. He focused on identical twins reared or raised apart. So in 1979, he came across an account of a pair of twins named Jim and Jim, Jim Springer and Jim Lewis, who had been separated from birth. They were reunited at the age of 35. The twins that Buford later wrote about were found to have married women named Linda, and then they got divorced, and then the second time they were married, they married somebody named Betty. Okay, that is freakishly weird. One of the twins named his son James Allen. Guess what the other named his son? James Allen. Both also named their pet dogs Toy. Whoa, now this is just like one anecdotal you can almost say is a case study because it's not only focusing on one, they didn't find this in all identical twins raised apart, research is still going on on those that they studied 100 pairs of identical twins separated at birth, all with similar results. Much of their personality, temperament, and intelligence were all the same or similar showing that there is such a huge genetic influence on all sorts of things other than the research studies have been showing with identical twins, right? Identical twins have shown a stronger correlation on IQ scores, and we've seen this on the chart compared to the fraternal twins or the adopted children who tend to have more similar IQ to their biological parents rather than their adoptive parents. Okay, and also researching out of the Human Genome Project suggested that intelligence has a genetic component. Scientists do point out that the basis of intelligence is complex, however, because it involves interaction of so many different genes. The last concept that we're going to talk about tonight is heritability. That is the amount of great variation within a group be attributed to genetic differences. Heritability and heredity are heredity is looking at differences in groups where heredity is looking at an in trait. You can only speak of heritable difference within a group of individuals who have shared the same environment. Anyway, that's all I have for you tonight, so have a good one and bye now.